depending on how this talk goes, I may need a new job. Uh, I need to tell you a couple of things. First of all is that our lawyers would love me to say uh, at Google with the system internally known as Borg, so we don't violate any trademark restrictions. And the second is I'm only the messenger. Uh, this system is built by a small cast of incredibly competent, talented people, and I'm just the person who's the front man who's been stuck in front of all of you to describe what it is, a few things that it can do. Most of what I'm going to be doing here is giving teasers to, uh, there'll be a test later, <coughs> Uh, teasers to things you will find in the paper. There is not time to describe all the stuff we managed to cram into the paper, and as you'll see when you look at it, we managed to use every single inch of column space we had available to us. Whoops. So for the past 15 years or so, Google has been building out the world's fastest, most powerful, highest quality cloud infrastructure toys on the planet. And I'm lucky enough to be able to get to use one of these things. In fact, get to use several of these things. But the reason we do it is to help our internal developers write software that people like you and I use as customers. So I want to start with just giving you a feel for what it's like to use these tools, their infrastructure tools, to make us help do our business. So I cast around for uh, a, an example application that would demonstrate the degree of sophistication and complexity and nuances of the software that we write internally. And I came across Hello World. So this is what you have to do if you're a developer and you want to start up Hello World on one of those clusters. Uh, internally. First of all, you have to say uh, a job name. You give a job as a set of tasks, all of which are the same. Uh, and you have to say where you want to run it. In this case, we have these things called cells. So imagine a cell as a logical management construct on top of a cluster. A cluster is a pile of machines that are all connected with a high-speed network, typically in a building. A cell is a unit of management that uh, the, the Borg manager looks after. So here we say a cell IC. I had to go look up where that is. I think it's in Iowa, but it doesn't actually matter. Then you say, I'd like to run my program. Turns out when we compile binaries, we put a bunch of stuff in them. This program, when I last looked, was about 45 meg of binary. This matters in a minute. And we're going to say, you can pass command, and argue, command line arguments. We actually allocate ports so we can share the port space on a machine. So here you say, pass in the port where you're going to serve your hello world on. And then you can say how much memory and disk space and stuff like that that you need. Uh, you don't have to, but I'm just giving this as representative examples. We don't need much CPU because we are literally going to say, hello world. Um, and then you get to say, well, how many copies of this would I like? In the, inside this job, I'm going to have some number of replicas of this task, the hello world task. And, you know, the thing that comes in the little code lab I lifted this from was five. Great. And you could press this, and it will go off, and it will stand up five replicas. Eh, that's not very interesting. What might be more interesting? How about 10,000? How big, how big is 10,000? Think of a thing that's about you know, the, the width of my two or three fingers like this, and I've got 10,000 of them. It would probably go around this room about one and a half times. 10,000 is quite a large number when you've got things you're trying to keep track of. So I did that, and I uh, looked at sort of how many tasks were running at what particular time after the thing I started, and I saw this graph. And I could tell that I had become acclimatized because I looked at that and said, Good grief, it took two and a half minutes to get 10,000 things running. What? That feels slow. 45 megabytes a piece times 10,000 copies splattered across your data center is actually rather good. I have become a little blasé, but this is the kind of thing you have access to when you have the software that we're going to describe here in the Borg system. Um, so it actually is rather nice. What, what it does is it does bunches of them at a time. It doesn't do them all in one go in case something else is coming along. But it gets from that little uh, small configuration thing I described to 10,000 copies of these things running simultaneously in a couple of minutes, which is fairly impressive. How did it do it? Well, here's a picture of the architecture of the system that that was fed to. The first thing I did was we, we compiled the program. We compiled the program, and we stuck it out into the cloud. It turns out it goes in our uh, distributed storage system out there, because that's just the way the compilation system works. And then we pass that configuration file on the top left hand here down to a command line uh, program called Borg Config. And what that is, it went and sent an RPC to the Borg Master. The Borg Master is the software that runs each of these cells. There is uh, one Borg Master per cell. It's a centralized solution. There are five copies of that Borg Master in case one of them disappears. They run a Paxos-based persistence store and an election algorithm to keep, make sure one of them up. But one of them is active and taking requests. And the first thing the Borg Master does is it writes it to that persistence store, your request, and then it says, got it. 
just in case your client disappears and breaks and fails. So if you were to come back up again and say, let's do this again, the reaction will be, well, actually, you've, I've already got that. Let's not repeat it. If you want a new one, you actually have to put things like a timestamp on it to make sure I want another one with a different name. Great, so I now have an intention description. I, I say, I want to be running this task, or this, this job with these 10,000 tasks in it. Sometime later, the scheduler, which is a separate asynchronous process, picks that up and says, hmm, this thing says there should be 10,000 tasks running. Are there? No, that's odd, let's fix it. So what it does is it does a repeated pass of placing uh, those tasks onto machines, or deciding where to place those tasks onto different machines. And it writes those decisions back into the persistent store in case the scheduler goes away and breaks, because then you can carry on. Sometime later, the bottom component, we call the, I think of the link shard, actually goes and talks to the physical machines. It, doesn't, well, it, it talks to an agent on the physical machines called the borglet, and it, asks, it looks at the persistent store and says, the persistent store says this machine should be running three copies of that task. Is it? No. Hmm. Let's fix it. And it sends commands down to the borglet to get the borglet to start the thing up and get going those, those tasks. The link shard polls each of those borglets roughly every uh, 10 seconds or so uh, and keeps update information about what's going on. There's a bunch of interesting stuff about what happens when things fail. You'll find more of that in the paper. But the whole thing is designed in such a way that we can tolerate a number of different failures potentially simultaneously and most of the time the stuff will stay up. Uh, what the borglet does is it says, great, you want me to run that task, do I have a copy of that binary? Hmm, no, let's make it so. So it goes and pulls a copy, actually we use a sort of combination of pull and a torrent-like distribution protocol to get those uh, five to 10,000 copies, is my guess, of that binary sp spread across this data center pretty quickly. So there we have it, we have Hello World, we have this marvelous machine running Hello World, 10,000 copies of it, you can go to any of those instances and it will show Hello World. In real life, of course, you actually do interesting things like run Gmail and Google Docs and web search and stuff like that. So let's go back and look a little bit about, about these, these 10,000 copies. Was it actually 10,000 copies? Not quite. It's a little more complicated than that. Right? So this was the best case I found, 9,993. It never got above that. There were always some number of tasks in this pending state or the setup state. Those are basically either in the scheduler waiting to be placed or uh, to be decided where to put it and getting itself ready to run. Uh, and then they would go, this number would go up and down. It would oscillate somewhere below 10,000. What's going on? This is what's going on. The first thing I need to do here is to tell you the difference between production jobs and non-production jobs. For the purposes of this paper, a production job is something that, think of it as an instance of Gmail or web search or Google Docs. It's typically a user-facing application. It runs at sort of what we call production priority. It gets full unfettered access to the raw resources on machines. And then there's everything else, which we're calling non-production. Most batch jobs are non-production jobs. They are written to tolerate the fact that they are less important. The lifetime, or the, the, the behavior you see as a production is pretty good, right? The main reason that you'll see outages as a production task is because we've decided to upgrade the operating system on the machine you're running on. So we'll take all the tasks down, upgrade the operating system, and bring them back up again. If you're a non-production task, and it turns out when you run the Hello World app to make it work quickly and easily, you run the lowest possible priority in the system, life is rather different. Any production task that needs any of the resources that you're using right now gets precedence you lose, you will be evicted. And what you see here is a failure rate, and we measure it in evictions per task week, of non-production tasks. And the, by far the majority of the evictions take place because somebody else wants the resources that you're currently sitting on. So how do we get back to that 9,993? Well, it turns out I told you 10,000 is a lot. 10,000 really is a lot. It's 10,000 uh, units of thingies burning about one task week per minute across that set of things. So what we're seeing, in fact, was an order of magnitude of six to eight failures going on simultaneously, and things being preempted, and then the scheduler saying, that's not, they're not running, let me go find somewhere else for them. That was just a regular churn, just because of the other workload that was taking place being added into that cell. This is just fine. It's perfectly okay if you plan for it. Almost all of the software we write, probably all of the software we write, is the, the design discussions are around failure cases, first, performance, second. How do we make sure the thing stays up? If it's not up, it doesn't matter how fast it is. So a lot of the stuff that you'll find in the, in the design discussions in the board paper is around the failure handling case. Great, 
So once we've got the thing up, and let's pretend for the moment that we've actually understood some of those things, now we can turn our attention to how do we make it up efficiently. And then there's a bunch of stuff here I'm going to talk about. Let's go through quickly a bunch of policy choices we've made about how do we, how do we choose to do certain things. That sometimes they're the same as other people, and sometimes they're different. And in the process of writing the paper, what we discovered, you know, it was, it was received wisdom that we would do things this way, and that we, as the group who are writing the paper, asked the question, well, clearly it helps. Good. How much? And we didn't know. Now we do, and I'm going to share it with you. So the first thing to observe is um, this is what we're trying to do, right? We're basically trying to do bin packing. We're trying to keep that expensive tool that we have lying around in those data centers as well used as possible. This is a graph from packing some external virtual machines that we were doing from an experiment for an, one of our external cloud workloads. Um, and the thing that's interesting, so each vertical line here represents one machine. The space at the top is the number of CPU cores that are allocated, and the, and the thing at the bottom for the same vertical line is the amount of memory allocated. Each different color chunk represents a different virtual machine. And the thing to look for here is the spaces that are white in one area and not white in the other. Because those are stranded resources. So for example, the bottom here, we've got a pile of unused memory that we can't use because we burnt up all the CPU. So that basically is wasted. You want a packing algorithm that doesn't do that. And we spent a lot of effort trying to make sure our packing algorithms are less inefficient. Things over in this portion here aren't so bad, right? Because we've got spare memory and we've got spare CPU. So that's actually just an opportunity. We could put something in there. We could use that. Just we haven't got right now a piece of workload that would fit into it. So that raises an interesting question. is How do you evaluate different packing algorithms? If you just ask the standard thing, which is what is the utilization of the resources in this cell, you, you end up with a completely uninteresting answer. Right? You take a workload, you take a cell, you tweak your packing algorithm, and you run the same workload on the same cell. Your utilization has not changed. So as a metric, utilization is not a good one for evaluating packing algorithms. What we ended up deciding to use, and we actually published a paper about this, you'll see it at the bottom, is a thing we call cell compaction. Take a cell and randomly remove machines from it, and see if you can still pack the same workload. And stop when you can no longer pack the same workload. The reason for randomly removing machines is that our cells are not homogeneous. They have different varieties of machines. And you want to maintain the same mixture of the ratios of machines in those cells as you do this. You want to maintain all the, the sophisticated constraints and requirements that those workloads have in order to be able to make sure you haven't simplified and done synthetic uh, extrapolation of what it is it's going to be possible for. You'll find much more details in that paper. But the end result is, you, you, if you run it a few times, you'll end up with a bunch of information saying, how much could I squeeze this? And we did this both for the baseline policy, which is what we currently have in production, and then for various different choices. And I'm going to go through a couple of those choices in a moment. We made policy choices and said, what would happen if we made this choice differently than we do now? How many extra machines would we have to buy in order to be able to accommodate the exact same workload? Here's the first thing. What happens if we were to split the production workload, the user-facing front-end stuff, from the batch jobs? Some companies actually run different clusters for batch jobs and production jobs. Fine, policy choice. What would happen if we did that? This is a CDF for a representative sample of 15 cells we picked out um, from the cluster, sorry, from, from the set of clusters we have. Uh, the error bars represent we ran the compaction algorithm 11 times, and we show you the range that they occurred in. And now we plot how many extra machines as a percentage of the, of the baseline will we have to have for that set of 15. A couple of things to notice. There isn't a single answer. Because those cells are doing different things, they have different workloads, they have different uh, machine makeups, they have different workload makeups. So you get a variety. You'll see graphs, most of the graphs are going to be looking like this. The second is the midpoint here is somewhere uh, 25 to 30 percent extra machines if we separated our production load from our batch load. That's why we don't do that. <laughs> what would happen if we split our cells into smaller cells, right? The median size of our cells are around about 10,000 machines. Once you've thrown away the small test cells, the thing, things with 5,000 machines in them or less, um, 10,000 machines is reasonably large. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't we use smaller ones? Well, again, higher overhead, fragmentation occurs. So this is what happens if you split them into two, five, or 10 subcells. The number of machines that you need in order to be able to keep the same, the same workload running uh, with the same workload, with the same machine mix, goes up. Costs more money. That's why we don't do that. Why, don't we, why not go to the other extreme and make massive large cells? Failure containment. It's too easy to make a mistake and wipe out a cell. One of my colleagues did this. He mistyped a two-letter name and turned down the wrong cell. Eh, it happens. 
you get the same kind of thing if you segregate users into different cells as well. Essentially, you lose out the benefits from statistical aggregation and multiplexing with helps graph in paper. Another thing to look at in our world is that when you make a request, I showed you this originally um, for resources, you get to specify exactly how many bytes of memory you want, or exactly how many CPU cores, or exactly how much disk space. We don't force you into particular fixed size buckets. So here's a graph of CDF of uh, the amount of, of, uh, of the requests that people make. And it's basically a moderately smooth curve, uh, which basically means that there is no magic fixed numbers that people like, with a couple of exceptions. Here's one. It's surprisingly common that people ask for one CPU core, because that exactly fixed their workload, right? Right. Um, the other interesting case is these two, something like a 20th of a CPU core and a 100th of a CPU core. We believe these are people gaming the system. They're saying, I need such a little stuff, you can fit me anywhere. And then I will just take advantage of the fact that there's probably a little bit of slack resources on that machine and get away with it. This is fine, this is okay, but it turns out it's really not a good idea to do um, bin packing of all of those things onto one machine. We know this because we did. But this has raised some interesting questions like, so what would happen if we did actually do what you do in the sort of the infrastructure as a service providers and, and force people to round that up to some kind of sort of power of two like virtual <laughs> machine boxy thing? So we did the same, we did, we did exactly that experiment. Uh, it turns out there's an upper and lower band to do with the policy of what you do with things that are too big for a machine. Uh, and the answer is we would be burning 30 to 40% more machines to run the same workload if we forced everybody to round them up to a virtual machine like size of which was a, a power of two. So we don't do that. That's why we have these fine-grained resource allocation requests. Something else we do is that we discover that, you know, in the same way that people will make requests and then it turns out they don't use all of it, um, we can find ways of reclaiming some of those resources. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how do we make the, the efficiency even higher by overcommitting stuff. So this is a graph from a paper by uh, some, some students who looked at the trace we published uh, sometime in late 2011 of a single Borg trace, Borg cell. Um, the pink stuff here represents this two things, two timelines, 29 days of trace. The left-hand one is the stuff that actually got used and consumed and burnt up. The right-hand stuff is what we allocated. If you look at the right-hand one for a second, you'll see we allocate more than 100% of the CPU. The pink stuff represents production workloads that cannot uh, or sorry, must always be available if you need them in case there is a workload spike. When Michael Jackson died, we saw an enormous workload spike. Think about what happens when he comes back to life. That's what that's there to serve. But turns out that doesn't happen very often. Uh, hasn't happened yet. Um, so the, in practice, the actual usage pattern is, is much lower. There's a bit of diurnal variation. You can see the wiggles on the left. But that means there's a lot of slack of stuff that is allocated just in case but not used. Same thing for memory, although we don't quite overcommit. The stuff that's green and black is the batch jobs. They can tolerate stuff, right? We know they already have all sorts of reasons for being evicted, but we can run them in resources that are a little flaky. So we do that by a technique we call resource reclamation. So when a, a job comes along, it says, I want this many resources, then we, then we watch it, we observe it, this is the actual usage pattern, and we put an envelope above that, we call it the reservation, and the stuff above the reservation and below the limit is basically resources that are allocated, they're available if it needs it, but right now, we, didn't, we think there is a very low likelihood that actually is going to be used. So we can run other stuff in there if it's willing to put up with being evicted, if it turns out the prediction was wrong, which is exactly what we do with our batch jobs. Here's what's happened if we stop doing that. It turns out it really helps. Squeezing batch jobs on top of the production workload saves an awful lot of machines. Uh, if we turned off the resource reclamation and insisted that batch jobs have their own dedicated resources, we'd probably spend, some, again, a median of around about 25% extra resources. That's a lot of money at our scale. Help you calibrate a few percent means a new data center. A new data center is a few hundred million dollars. So that was a sort of static analysis. Let me give you one example of a dynamic case. There's a couple of reasons for showing you this. One, because there's a nice story with it, and the second is that this is actually an example of real-world data. Real-world data is like this. It's messy. If you're looking for interesting problems to solve, think about messy user data rather than this kind of stuff. So the goal here was to reduce the amount of yellow, which is the slack between the actual usage and the reservation, by saying, let's be more aggressive. 
and the first baseline is on the left, repeated on the right, and the two things in the middle are of different degrees of aggressiveness. We managed to reduce the amount of slack, but if you look at this line here, you'll see we had an awful lot more evictions. So that was an unfortunate trade-off. Midway between those two turns out to be about the right level of aggressiveness without having too many extra evictions. So that's what I've shown you. That's the picture that, that all of that stuff maps into, these little four bo boxes. The rest of the world is actually rather complicated. Borg is a tiny e part of the ecosystem. What we want our developers to do is to not worry about that stuff. We write the rest of that ecosystem so they can focus on their application. One of the ways we do that is by giving people containers. We take away all the worry about dealing with operating systems and that stuff for you. We use the containers in order to be able to provide. This is just your application. Focus on that part. And we've just released an open source version of some of this stuff called Kubernetes, which is derived from many of the ideas you've heard me talk about here. Uh, it's, uh, it stands for pilot or helmsman of a ship. You'll find it on GitHub. It runs on GCE and uh, raw machines. You can download and play with it. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about it here was that it is actually has a whole bunch of ideas that were directly lifted from what Borg did. Right? Some of the stuff about allocations, which are groups of tasks running inside the same memory resources unit, has become a Kubernetes pod. It has a direct analog of the Borglet, which is called a kubelet, which is the agent runs on each of the machine. The persistent store, same idea. The idea of declarative specification so you can get failure tolerance, same idea. But we've also put a few new things in that have changed because of we've learned from the Borg experience and there are things that it does that we don't like. For example, the existing Borg model has a very restricted idea of what a job means. It's the only way of building collections, is, of collections of tasks, is to have a thing called a job. Kubernetes has a much more rich structure based around, sort of imagine, overlapping sets of things. You can talk about the front-end canaries that are, were released less than 24 hours ago. I want to update them. You can't really do that in Borg without explicitly constructing job names, which is really painful. Borg manages IP address, manages um, port numbers, Kubernetes doesn't have to do that because we've got IPv6. We can give every single port its own IP address and so on. And then the other thing is, is this move towards sort of microservice-like structure rather than a single monolithic master which is in control of the whole world. Like I said, download it, play with it. Version 1 will be available in a small number of weeks or months. Uh, should be ready for production. I wouldn't put production on stuff on it beforehand. But if you're looking for an experimental test bed to do uh, interesting research on, at least think about this one. And um, that's basically it. I just want to leave you with these three thoughts. I'm happy to take questions on pretty much everything you've heard. Um, if you're going to get resiliency, you have to really aim at getting resiliency. Everything you do has to be focused on making sure you don't have single points of failure, that you can tolerate things going wrong. You can cope with stuff like partitions and 2,000 machines appear like they have vanished. You don't want to panic. You want to be able to do the right thing and say, let's rate limit the change just in case it's temporary. You want to be able to keep running on your machine even if the master goes away. All of those things are designed to keep the thing up. The way I like to say this is the reason Google looks like it's so reliable from the outside is that we assume it's completely unreliable on the inside. And we write software to handle that stuff. So that's the first point, the resiliency thing. The second is once you've got resiliency, once it's up, you can start working about how do you spend less money to keep it running and doing what you want. So efficiency, in our case, comes a lot from sharing resources and being able to repurpose stuff that is not currently in use on the understanding that it might be in use again in a little while, but that's just an example of a failure case. It's really nice to have a failure budget for your applications because you can use that for things like effectively migrating stuff or coping with reclaiming resources in a world where they're not currently available or they might not be available. And then finally, our experience has been that this notion of containers rather than, say, virtual machines and stuff like that is actually very helpful for your developers in making sure they can focus on the stuff they need to worry about. And we're trying to share that with the world through release of Kubernetes. Thank you. There's a, mic a microphone on its way. Can you hear me if I use this? Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for the great talk as usual. I have two small questions. The first one, is the fault contamination the only reason against large cells or there are other reasons? For example, supporting the higher throughput for scheduling. Uh, we build large-ish network. I mean, there is some scale 
which we have not yet hit, at which point the networking bandwidth cross, you know, et cetera, will actually be uh, cost prohibitive. We're a ways away from that right now. So it, but it primarily it's driven by the failure tolerance characteristics, uh, with one exception. And the people who push this are the folk like sort of some of the search indexing teams who want us to be building larger and larger clusters, and they're actually pushing the envelope. I talked about the median size. I didn't tell you the maximum. It's quite a lot bigger. Well, yeah. <laughs> But then the second question, in the paper you used CPI when you wanted to, to compare the dedicated cells, the, the, the impact of sharing cells into the dedication cells. So you haven't seen any contention on I.O. or cache or other stuff? That's the uh, so point. she's talking about uh, using the cycle, cycles per instruction measure to, so since you asked. Um, we use cycles per instruction to try and find out whether our applications are interfering with each other. And it turns out most of the time they're not. This is a graph of sort of how much um, wait time you have to have as an application while you're, something else is going on. Because we don't overcommit the actual important resources on the machine, in practice it tends to work quite well. Uh, the question though is does that extend to things like I.O. contention? Almost all of our I.O. is either um, remote access to disks or other services that are running elsewhere in the cluster. So basically it's the network. We build good networking. Most of the time that doesn't have conflicts. The other I.O. request that takes place is uh, the D, which is the storage manager. I think of the r improved version of GFS. Um, that access is local disk, but it basically owns that stuff. And D is responsible for the prioritization of the traffic that it gets. And it has very sophisticated algorithms that I'm not going to go into here about making those kind of trade-offs. But it's hard, right? It, there is contention. It does matter. We do what we can to deal with it. There's a bunch of techniques, not the subject of this talk. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, Vyacheslav Alkohovay. You've mentioned that you uh, run even your uh, virtual machines under uh, containers. Is there, uh, what is actually the reason for that? Uh, is that security some kind of aspect or your, uh, basically it's, uh, you uh, limit the, resu uh, the resources tw twice on the virtual machine level and on the container level? And so we use, we use containers as the unit of uh, resource con allocation and, uh, and, uh, and management. So the containers give us all of that uh, sort of allocation control. We run VMs in those things because to us they're just customers of the, you know, the resource allocation system. Why do we run some things in VMs rather than not? Well, that's primarily a security provisioning issue. We don't want to have just one level of breakout. We want to have two levels of breakout. Uh, you have to get through before you be able to p uh, perpetrate anything. There are whole. I mean, I don't, if you notice that that slide of the ecosystem, there was a lot of yellow on it. Yellow is the security infrastructure. We take this stuff incredibly seriously. So no external workload right now does not. So runs on raw machines. It runs on VMs. Don't want to make that true. And the second is, you know, VMs are what some external people want. So we give it to them. Okay. Thank you.